That will be Anjas Winter. Uh, this is a joint work with Anj uh, by Anjas Winter and uh, Ring Yao Duan in the audience, our <laughs> our host. Uh, so this uh, this work is about non-signaling correlation, uh, non-signaling assisted zero error uh, content communication. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'll, I try to stay close to the to the microphone. Yeah, so as, uh, as our uh, chair said, this is joint work with our wonderful host and, and local organizer, Rune Yao-Duan. Here is the uh, archive number, so if you miss anything during the talk or if you, you have doubts, you can, you can go to the, to the paper and, and read that. Um, so I, I assume that some of you <laughs> stayed out late yesterday, and so I, I decided to, to prepare a special summary for you. So these are, these are essentially the main points. In the, so the, it's at the same time, it's also a bit of a, uh, a guidance of the structure of the talk. This is five, five parts. So in the first two, I will just remind you of some kind of fundamental notions on graphs, zero error capacity, and this LOVAS number that, uh, that is, uh, is a classic uh, graph parameter already. And we like it a lot because it's semi-definite and all this. So in these first two parts, we will show that the zero error capacity and also the so-called entanglement of zero, uh, assisted zero error capacity, which you will learn are properties of the graph, are upper bounded by this uh, LOVAS number, whatever that is. And um, then in the, in the second half, I want to uh, show basically the, well, one of the main results in, in this summary, the main result, which is that if you bump up the power of your assisting resources to not just entanglement assisting, but mysterious no signaling, uh, correlations, then you get an equality here. So yeah, this is, that's the thing. This is an equality. These two are just inequality signs. In fact, for the first one, we know that it's strictly in, uh, different in some cases. And for this one, we just don't know what the status is. Might or might not be examples of strict inequality. Okay, so like in the previous talk, uh, we are concerned with communication via channels. We want to send classical messages over a noisy channel. And I will start with uh, the simple setting of um, of classical channel, which is basically just a stochastic map between input and output alphabets. So it's entirely given by a, a matrix of, of uh, transition probabilities. And our objective, our objective is to send information in X, encoding into X, in such a way that the receiver who sees only Y can be certain about the message. And so when you think about this, what that means is, so if, if you want deterministic decision here, it means that the actual values of these transition probabilities don't really matter except whether they are zero or non-zero. We have to deal with any possible value given x, however unlikely it is. And so that motivates the introduction of two combinatorial objects. The first one is exactly what I said. It just records which are the possible transitions. That's why I call it transition graph. It's a bipartite graph between the input and the output, letters or alphabets. And uh, so I give it to you in, the terms of in terms of an adjacency matrix. I put a one. if the probability of the channel is positive, a zero if it's zero. The confusability graph is, is a slightly more complicated, but I think equally in intuitive notion. Um, it's, a gra it's an undirected graph on the, on the input symbols. And we call two symbols confusable if there is a possibility that they lead to the same output symbol. So this is this condition here. Uh, under this, con in this definition, note that this means that every symbol is confusable with itself, obviously. And so we call this the Lovas convention. So uh, x tilde x prime, this is, the confus this is the confusability relation. It's either they are equal or they are joined by an edge in this confusability graph. So this, this is just a way of recording the combinatorics of this confusability relation. OK, so maybe you want to see an example, because you're still a bit slow, of course. Um, so here's, a, here's an example from, from uh, Shannon's paper. It's called it, he called it the typewriter channel. Um, I won't go into this. Uh, five input symbols, five output symbols. So I didn't even write the probabilities. These arrows are the possible transitions. And at the same time, this is basically a, a visualization of the transition graph. And the corresponding confusability graph is a graph on five vertices. It's a five cycle or pentagon. Uh, even simpler example is if you have the, the same channel, this typewriter idea with three symbols, then the confusability graph is the three cycle or complete graph. So every symbol is confusable with everyone else. And uh, so I show this only to make the point that there is another graph, which is a complete, I mean, a different channel with a completely different graph of, of transitions. In fact, it's a trivial channel. It maps everything to the same point here that has the same confusability graph. So this guy, this side, these things, they contain still a little bit more information than that one. 
Um, we are going to do Shannon's theory, so it's, it was, was implicit in Andrea's talk uh, uh, that we want to use these channels m multiple times, or at least we want to construct co more complicated channels from simple ones, and in the, in the fundamental operation is just the product of channels, a product of noise. And so we have to c uh, reflect a little bit, if we know the combinatorics of, this of those transitions here for the individual channels, what does it imply for the transitions of the product channel? And you will see immediately that on the level of the uh, adjacency matrix is just the tensor product. Why? Because a product, this product here is zero if and only if one of the two factors is zero. And the same is true for the adjacency matrix of the confusability graph, but there we have to put this extended adjacency matrix, as I call it, you put the ones in the diagonal to, to record that each symbol is confusable with itself. And then it's still, you just have a, a tensor product of these matrices. This, the operation here on the level of the graph is called strong graph product. It's strong because there are plenty of other graph products, but we won't need any of those. And I think this, these formulas in terms of adjacency matrices are mo the most uh, straightforward ones. Okay, let's go back to the zero error problem. I said we want to encode information. So this, if this is a message, the Alice will have to apply some encoding function to get a, an input symbol, stick in the channel, and then Bob gets one of the possible Y, right? So this is given by the transition graph. And so when you think about it, if, if Bob wants to be certain about the message, it means that the different code words must not be confusable. So they must be independent in, in the graph theory jargon in the graph G, in the confusability graph. And so the code book, the set of these F of I, must be an, a so-called independent set in the graph, pairwise non-adjacent. And so the usual problem in communication theory is how to optimize the use of the channel in the sense you want to maximize the, the throughput. You want the largest number of, pos the largest code book, and that's, so the largest size of an independent set, that's a bit more of jargon, it's the independence number of the graph G. It's one of the classic number, uh, very interesting for, for various purposes. And once it's one of the oldest, I think it's among the, it's among this, the very first list of, of uh, natural problems that are shown to be NP-complete. And so there are, at this point, of course, you can have sort of two different attitudes. One of them is, well, okay, I mean it's NP-complete, so just forget about it. You, know, it's, you, know, you won't be able to do a, make a general theory about this. Maybe you can approximate. Turns out you can't. Even approximating it is NP-complete, uh, NP-hard. And so what, what's left is, well, okay, let's just try to find decent bounds and uh, particularly upper bounds, and so this leads me to the other things, this uh, Lovas number. So I said it's, an, it's a semi-definite program, so it's, it's actually written here, in it's one of the many forms that Lovas gave in his original paper. J is the matrix of all ones, and B is basically a state, it's positive with trace one, positive semi-definite with trace one, and the rows and columns indexed by the confusability graph. Um, so this inequality, given the definition, this inequality is, is elementary. When you, when you I let you stare at it a little bit more, you will be able to discover, given an independent set, uh, a feasible solution that, that, that makes this trace bj equal to alpha. There's another number, an older one, that comes from Shannon's paper on the zero error problem. It's called the fractional packing number, and uh, it's, a, it's actually a linear program. So you have, uh, you have weights assigned to all the vertices, or to all the input symbols, and in such a way that if for each output symbol you look at the at its preimage, you look at all the possible x's that could lead to that, and the total weight of this preimage must be less or equal to one. So again, you can easily construct a feasible solution. In fact, if you if you add an additional constraint here that the w's are either zero or one, then you recover exactly a way of characterizing the the uh, uh, independence number. So both of these here are convex relaxations of a, com of a combinatorial problem. So this is a, is a, is a very nice uh, favorite subject for many combinatorialists. And what's more, they are, this is SDP and this is, well, semi-definite program and this is linear program. So they both have lots of nice properties as, as optimization problems and they both can be solved efficiently, at least to the extent that the number of constraints is not, I mean, in, in the, uh, of course, if the number of constraints is huge, then you have also problems. So as, as, as an upper bound on alpha, this is, this is superseded by, by uh, this fraction pack number is superseded by theta. Still, uh, I just, you know, I just re re repeat what Shannon said. Okay, I mean, this is my best upper bound. Um, let's just minimize over all channels with the same confusability graph. And so you get some kind of fractional packing number of a graph. It's, a, it's really a property of the, of the set of all gammas with the same confusability graph. 
and uh, and this is indeed a taint, so this is really a minimum. You you have to construct a channel that has an, an output symbol for each click of the graph, for each completely uh, uh, connected uh, subset. I mean, a complete subgraph of of uh, G. Okay, that's just a small thing. Okay, and to complete the the Shannon theory stuff. Well, uh, we want to, as I said, we want to use many copies of the channel, and so the, the, the problem that Shannon wanted to address originally was not to compute some independence number, but to understand the asymptotics of this problem as, uh, as the number of channel uses and the length of the message goes to infinity. So we know already what is the, what is the graph of n channel uses. It's this n-fold strong graph product. The optimal use of that is given by the independence number. The rate is this one, one of n log of this. It's kind of number of bits per channel use. And we want to know what's the limit of this as n goes to infinity. That is the definition of the zero error capacity. This is, this is a good definition because the limit exists. In fact, it's equal to the soup of this here, as n goes to, I mean, over all n. Because, well, this is, I'm really sorry that I wrote this at the, at the bottom, because alpha is super multiplicative. So the independence number of a graph product, of a product of two graphs is larger or equal than the product of the independence numbers. <coughs> And so this is upper bound by the log of the lowest number, and this is really the genius contribution in this paper, not to define some semi-definite bound on the independence number, that would have been easy, there are plenty of ways of doing this, but to find one that is multiplicative. So you kind of, in this limit of taking more and more copies of G, you are here, we really don't know what's going on, how this number, how, how this sequence of numbers goes. But this is just, the upper bound is just a constant, it's just log of theta of G. And so this is what we get. This is kind of what we find from, from Lovas. The, the zero error capacity is lower bound by the log of alpha of G. And you can do this also for some finite graph power if you're able to compute the independence number. It's, it's upper bound by the log of the Lovas number. And this is a in turn upper bound by the log of the fractional packing number, which of course is a, is a stupid bound here. I just write it because uh, talking about multiplicativity, also this one is multiplicative. Also this alpha here, is alpha star is multiplicative, which was which was used explicitly by Shannon in his treatment. Okay, so uh, I've been spending a bit of time with the, with the background here. Uh, all of these inequalities can be strict, and uh, for some of them, the very simple examples suffice. So in fact, the graphs we already know, for example, this pentagon, uh, pentagon graph and the corresponding typewriter channel, you I mean, it's, it's small enough that you can just work it out uh, while you're sitting there, uh, boredly listening to my talk. The independence number of C5 is two, of the five cycle is two. The independence number of C5 times C5 is five. I mean, it's, it's actually easy to find a, an independent set of size five that you can't find anyone better. Okay, maybe you have to work a little bit more. But it's bigger, this is already bigger than two times two. In on the other hand, the log of theta, uh, the theta is square root of five. So from this we see that for the five cycle, this is an equality, but this is strict inequality and this is also strict inequality because you can work out the linear program again on paper is five over two. So this is bigger than square root of five. Um, okay, since we are with, this, with my typewriter example, the, the, the three symbol typewriter, so the one where we have the complete graph is a confusability graph. We had two possible channels to, to, uh, to represent this complete graph. One was the typewriter and one was the trivial channel. And they do actually differ in the independent, in excuse me, in the fractional packing number, or a fractional independence number, if you want. Uh, the first one is three over two, the other one is one. So the, the, this, this um, the note up here that all of the, the first three things I always write as a function of G. They are either manifestly or, or provably a function of the graph only. You don't have to know anything else about the channel. This one is a function of gamma. You don't, it's not enough to know just G. So also random graphs give, uh, give big separations here and here. Well, sorry, here between alpha and theta and between theta and alpha star. I don't want to go into this. The middle one is a, is a bit harder, but in fact it was immediately, before even the paper of Lovas appeared, Wilhelm Hammers uh, gave, an, gave an example, a very, very con specific example. By now we know an another, we know basically several families of very, very peculiar graphs where you have strict inequality here. And that's by introducing a sort of an ad hoc algebraic bound that usually is completely intractable and, and probably also terribly bad. But in for these very specific and highly structured graphs, <coughs> you uh, you have you can show that you can show a gap here. Um, 
Yeah, so this, this I, I, I say this, so that you can actually improve this uh, Lovas bound here, but there is kind of a, there is a, there is a catch. So it's something that I don't know if this was known, but I discovered this together with uh, Runiao here, uh, Tony Asin and, and Belen Sainz uh, last year or the year before. You can try to improve this Lovas number, but if you do that, you lose the multiplicativity property. If you, if you change it on, on even on a single graph, I mean, you, you lower it, of course, it still has to be larger than the alpha number. It won't be multiplicative anymore, or vice versa. Any any number, any graph between alpha and theta that is also multiplicative is equal to theta. <coughs> and so this multiplicativity, of course, we like it because it helps us dealing with the asymptotic limit. Um, uh, enough of that. Uh, just to conclude this, uh, it's a very a very beautiful article. We probably can't read this either down here by uh, Alon and, and Lumetsky, where they study how. Boop, 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 boop. how this limit here, how, the, how this sequence of number behaves, so kind of how for small n you might get the impression how you approach the limit. And so they make this observation that it's not even known how to decide C0 of G, a computation or, or deciding whether it's bigger or smaller some, than some value. That's, that's not open, it's the it's last open question in their paper after making lots of observations. Uh, they say, well, look, uh, we don't have any way of, des of determining anything about the C0. I mean, we're not talking about NP-hardness here, right? I'm talking about Turing computability or there. Okay, so here's the status. We have this inequality. We know it's sometimes strict. And so, okay, you can go on and try to improve the upper bound. But there is a bit of a, a different attitude, which is, well, maybe we, maybe we should just make this quantity a little bit better behaved. And uh, one of the things we can do in information theory is we just allow, we just give some resources for free. And that's not at all a new idea. So one of the things that Shannon did, in fact, himself, in again, in the first paper on zero algebras, was allow feedback, instantaneous feedback of each channel use. And he showed that the corresponding zero error capacity with feedback is equal to the log of this fractional packing number. Beautiful result. Um, the things we want to consider here is entanglement, a little bit, very briefly, and no signaling correlations. What's um, yeah, so the entanglement is basically still part of the background, and then we will move on to the, to the no signaling. So I'll show you just a couple of slides. Uh, so take heart, we're kind of getting there slowly, slowly. Um, free entanglement, what does that mean? Uh, well, okay, Alice and Bob share an entangled state, and, and to use the channel, Alice will you will have to exploit the entanglement. So I mean, in the end, the channel is classical, so it has to get, a, uh, has a classical match, he has to get a classic extra measurement. And likewise, Bob, he gets a classical output, and he will make a measurement, and he gets a, a J. And so the condition is that J should be equal to I with probability one. And so the only question is, okay, what kind of, how do we optimize over this state and all those measurements? But if we could do this, then I can just say the maximum number of messages I can I can encode in such a way and decode is, is some property. It turns out it's a property of the graph only. I mean, a priori, you might think it's, it has to do with the transitions here, but you don't need gamma, you need only G. And, and I call it the entanglement assisted independence number because it's, it's like, I mean, it's basically, without the entanglement, this is a way of defining independence numbers. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a game, it's a, a task, an operational information task whose optimal performance is a way of characterizing independence numbers. So we just throw in some other, we just change the rules of the game, and so I just call it entanglement assisted. And we know this is non a non-trivial concept because a few years ago with uh, Toby Cubit and others, we discovered, and uh, well, actually all of us are here. So Debbie, Debbie is here and, and Will is here. Uh, we found that this can be strictly larger than alpha of G. And so there is also a non-trivial concept of entanglement assisted uh, zero error capacity when we have many uses of the channel. So one of the things uh, that in terms of upper bounds is, this is kind of beautiful result again. We am happy to report that an <laughs> another contributor, Salman Beghi, is here, proved that the Lovas theta is an upper bound to this entanglement assisted. So it's an improvement of Lovas' uh, result, which just showed alpha is less than theta. We can, we can squeeze in the alpha tilde. And so because of the multiplicativity, that's still an upper bound on the on the uh, on the capacity, I mean, it's I hope you can just pass this. So it's just the usual limit of asymptotic rates. We know examples of strict separation here, thanks to uh, 
almost all of, well quite a few people down listed down here uh, are present they are i mean these are these are very special graphs it would be very nice to know some more examples of some bigger separations and we would like to know a separation here or we would like to prove equality and it depends on your attitude but we just don't know the status of this <coughs> let me go into this no signaling actually um, yeah, at this point I, I just explained it too uh, basically we need some kind of i mean the entanglement what does it serve in the previous picture it just serves to to correlate those channel inputs and outputs with the messages that we encode and decode so we can i mean in fact this is very much like in in will's talk uh, will matthews talk yesterday uh, we just uh, couple the channel with a, a general no signaling correlation uh, that's why we do this well ultimately because these guys are easier to deal with than entanglement assistance and you just try to play around with this and so you define an, another independence number a no signaling assisted independence number which now depends on the transition graph so you can you cannot longer show that it only depends on G but really on the transition graph on the biopotential graph and so um, when you stare at this here, so it's just, I mean, this I just wrote it out in, in painful detail, the maximum integer such that you have a no signaling correlation with i and j are messages from 1 to m, x and y are vertices in the graph. Um, this has to be no signaling and so on. So these are all linear uh, equalities or inequalities. And so you can definitely check whether a given integer is, is uh, feasible. So what is really what was really surprising it was that in fact, this number itself is given by a linear program, rather, uh, rather the integer part of a linear program, and this linear program turned out to be the same fractional fucking number as before. So we find that, I just wrote it again here, we find that the no signaling assisted zero error capacity of one of those transition graphs is given by the log of the fraction fucking number. So we increase the capacity again, but this time too much. We went all the way to the fractional fucking number, and which we know is is much bigger in general than the lowest number. So what what went wrong here? And so before I to explain that, I uh, I want to I need to kind of backtrack a little bit. Uh, so let's let's go away from these classical channels. I, I really have to laugh myself when you see this. No, it's, it's great. Uh, <laughs> I know I know many of you feel sympathetic with this kind of situation. Um, the we should we should not we should go away from these classical trends. I mean, in, in the end, we want to talk about communication via quantum devices, and also our resources are quantum. Okay, so quantum channel is easy. We know what it is. It's uh, CPT completely positive and transitory map. Um, I want to give this in most of the talk in terms of uh, of uh, Krauss decomposition. So there's each each channel basically is just a bunch of Krauss operators. And so um, point one is um, I want to advocate to you that there are in fact matrix or, or quantum versions of these uh, graphs that we were looking at. I mean, the, this transition graph and the confusability graph, they are very well generalized by this here. So this is K, the span of the uh, Krauss operators. This is kind of the, the quantum <laughs> transition graph. And this S here, this is the span of all the EI dagger EJ. This is the quantum version of the confusability graph. How is that? Uh, how is that? For a classical channel, uh, that's, that's the, the channels that give rise to those gamma and G, the Krauss operators can be chosen as such. They are just dyads, bra k, uh, x, ket, y, either with a uh, weight zero or one, and k is just a span of those. So this, I mean, gamma is zero or one, right? So depending on whether x and y is a possible transition, this is there or not. And so just looking at this, if knowing the basis, the x and y basis, we can read off gamma, and it's really the same thing. Uh, and the same for this S here. So we can we can read of G by by looking at these rank one objects bra x cat x prime that are present in the in the linear span. And um, okay, so let's uh, let's forget about this. So let's just go to the to the quantum no signaling. So we I also want to generalize the no signaling res resources to be something fully quantum because it has to kind of couple with a quantum channel. And so this is, if you've been at, at uh, Will's talking, if you still remember what he was talking about, that's basically what they are. These are, these are channels, CPTP maps, with two inputs and two outputs. 
in with a in addition the property that if you if you trace over for example this output then there is a, a well defined and unique dynamics from t to b so this is uh, for example this one here yeah? and vice versa on the other side that's no significant so the the cool thing is all these conditions here they are semi definite constraints because for example you look at the choi matrix parameterization of p and it says <coughs> the choi matrix has to be positive semi definite and there are linear constraints for example for the trace preserving that means that some partial trace is equal to something and this is also can be expressed as a finite set of linear equations so it's a very nice set of no signaling correlations here uh, let's forget about this as well and uh, yeah, actually maybe, maybe I shouldn't spend time on this conceptual part because I want to get on with uh, how to use this, right? So it's, it's how to use these correlations exactly like in the, in the previous case. We have this correlation. The no signaling makes sure that Alice, if she wa has wants to send a message, so the, class the input here is classically happens, she can stick it into, her into this box and the no signaling makes sure that there is a well-defined output here already. She doesn't have to wait for any input on Bob's side. And then conditioned on that, there is sort of a residual dynamics, a conditional dynamics on, on Bob's side, which he will activate once he gets the output from the channel. Note something here. Uh, we call this here no signaling, but this, this has nothing to do with space-like separation. In fact, it's the contrary, because Al Bob will use his box only after receiving the output from the channel. So he must be in the light cone of, Alice, of Alice's um, using the channel. So it's not like you can, I mean, it's, 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 it's very interesting, uh, and maybe, maybe potentially important point. Obviously, these kind of correlations, these kind of maps, they are more general than the things you could do by just having an entangled state and acting on them locally. It's very easy to see. <coughs> but it's not that this setting makes, makes it unphysical. I mean, like this P here could also have some kind of internal secret communication to realize it. I mean, it's a machine, and this machine will be activated at the moment that Alice sticks in the message here. It will send a message, an internal hidden message to, to Bob's machine here. And, and, uh, and necessarily the channel output will arrive after that message. So this kind of, this, this P here can be simulated. It could, it could, it's just, it happens to be on its own useless for communication. Okay, so we do the same thing. We define maximum number of messages. It, this, this depends as it turns out only on the on the on this k on the span of the Krauss operators, and you can do the same for independence number and entanglement assisted independence number, which in fact can be shown to depend only on the s on the quantum confusability graph. And so, result number one: uh, first of all, just like before, this is a feasibility problem over a semi-definite set. So clearly, you can check whether a given number is feasible or not. So the surprise is that the number, the maximum number itself is a semi-different program. You can optimize, the, you get this upsilon, and we take the integer part of it, that gives us the independence number. And upsilon is this rather ungainly uh, semi-different program with lots of variables and so on and constraints. Pi is the projector onto the, onto the Choi matrix. And uh, so the, the main point, I mean, you can stare at this for a while, but I don't expect you to understand it uh, very deeply in any time actually. The, the one of the I mean, important point to notice is if k, if k is classical, if the channel was classical, this reduces to the previous fraction factor. So it's a generalization of the previous result. Uh, but it has lots of other properties. So it's, it's like the fraction factor number. It's super multiplicative, but not, it turns out not in general multiplicative. So if you want to compute some capacity, we still have a regularization issue. And uh, so at this moment, it's still open. What is the, the no signaling assisted zero error capacity, which you notice is a function of k here. Um, we can do also the opposite. We can do some sort of reverse Shannon theorem uh, game. We can simulate channels. Like actually, uh, let, me, let me skip over this because I notice that I don't have really have a lot of time, um, which is also a semi-definite program uh, and which also reduces, it's a completely different one. It also reduces to the fraction packing number for classical channels, but in general, they are different. Okay, so to get back to eventually to the Lovas number, I mean, you remember that one, my, my main result was supposed to be that some capacity is equal to the Lovas number. Uh, we look at a special subclass of quantum channels. The it means in a sense, the least quantum among the quantum channels is CQ channels, where the input is classical. It's just a discrete choice. And this choice determines which state is the, the Bob is Bob going to see, and so e in from the zero error perspective, everything is given by the support projections of these row axes here. 
uh, well, you can write this Troy matrix. I mean, you, you, you massage a little bit this original Upsilon uh, uh, SDP with this particular choice of the Troy matrix. And it looks a bit more like a fractional packing number because you're summing up weights associated to the, to the axis, subject to some crazy inequality and, for e and equality constraints. So we didn't like that at all. And so we just looked at a relaxation that looks even more like a fractional packing number, namely this one here. So you just forget uh, this equality constraint and just keep an inequality here by just dropping one of these variables. So it's maximum number of S's such that you have this matrix inequality. And so both of these numbers, this and this here, still reduce to the fractional packing number in the classical case. And nice, even, even better, this A here is multiplicative. So it does serve as an upper bound on the, on the asymptotical zero error capacity. But not only this, so this is kind of the, for me, I mean, okay, apart from what I told you for the, for the hangover summary, for me, this is the main result of the paper. This is the most amazing and mysterious thing that comes out of this, that not only this log of this, this, uh, this quantum, and uh, this semi-definite packing, I'm sorry, is an upper bound on the zero error capacity, as it's by not saying, it's actually equal. And that despite the fact that this is not multiplicative, so this, this sequence here of the one over n log the epsilon, this is non-trivially increasing. So we have this whole sequence of, of, uh, of SDPs, they are uh, super multiplicative, and lo and behold, the regularization is given by a simple relaxation of the original SDP. It's not an SDP. And uh, I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't know of any other example of, of this happening. I don't think there can be many. I, I want to give you at least one idea of the proof. So what you actually show something very strong. You show that, that uh, upsilon and A of K, uh, A of K to the N, are only differ can only differ by a polynomial factor. And the way you do this, you just start from an optimal solution of this A of K, which you tensor up because it's multiplicative. It's an, it's an optimal solution of the n-fold problem. Then you look at the, at the problem you get, you have this huge permutation symmetry. So when you look at these e equality constraints you have to satisfy, they are effectively only polynomially many. And it looks like you have gigantic matrices, but you can boil this down to polynomially many equations that you satisfy. And by sacrificing this very small fraction of the objective function, you can show that these, these extra constraints somehow can be satisfied. And I mean, it's not like, you know, you should say, yeah, sure. I mean, on the contrary, I mean, this is totally uh, mind blowing why this should happen. I mean, you can look at the proof. I'm sure you, I mean, I don't understand it. I mean, even though I made it, but, but it's, uh, it's a mystery. I would like to know more examples of that. Um, let's go on in the, in the talk because I have to reach the conclusion at some point. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, what is this? This is simulation. I didn't want to talk about simulation, so this is another thing here. Uh, this for an example, the simplest uh, CQ channel is that of two pure output states, so you can parameterize them with this alpha plus minus beta. You can work out everything here. You can work out that the upsilon is one, and but for two copies, it's always larger than one. So it, this is an example of strict mu super multiplicativity. And for large n, it behaves like this here. And in fact, the the, the semi-definite packing number is one over alpha square. So this is kind of, if you power to n, you get one over alpha two n. Instead, the simulation cost is a different one. So this is an, an, a yet another example. So this is barely non-classical already. The simulation cost and the capacity differ. Unlike the fully classical case where this, uh, you have complete reversibility. Okay, so we arrive finally at the hangover breakfast. No, this uh, this should, be, should be a good sign to, that we're finishing. So this is, this is the best and like, well, to get me back to the last part of the talk. Now, we do the same as before. We minimize this thing here over all CQ channels with the same confusability graph. Confusability for CQ channels is simple. It just means that, they, I mean, co two things are confusable if the corresponding output states are non-orthogonal. And so this is the theorem, which now it doesn't even, it's not even very difficult because basically we just take one of those many characterization of theta from Lovas's original paper and we discover somehow that this minimization over A of K is one of them. And so that means that the minimum capacity of zero error capacity of this assisted by no signaling of this K is equal to log of theta. So it's kind of, uh, the, the lowest theta gives the, this the no signaling assist capacity of, the <coughs> of not a single CQ channel, but of the worst one among all those with a given confusability graph. And so as far as I know, this is the first 
information theoretical interpretation of theta, I mean, in the sense as a capacity, as a, as a performance parameter of a, of a communication problem. So here's the, here's the end. I just want to highlight some, some open problems. So I, I think I, I said enough about, about this crazy point that you have this sequence of STP that regularized to another STP. Um, um, we, I, I, should, I really want to stress that we still, we don't know what kind of resources are really necessary to go there. I mean, this kind of uh, entanglement assistance still is at least cannot go above the, lo the lower theta, but it and could be that it's actually equal, but we just don't know that. If they are different, well, the question is, maybe there's some other, maybe you maybe have some other class of quant uh, correlations which get you there. I mean, uh, there are these kind of beautiful closed sets of correlation like Nava squares, Q1, uh, we don't know how this, how assistance by such sets uh, relates to the lowest number. Um, and so the other thing is, uh, is unfortunately the poster session uh, that I'm referring to was already Monday. So the, the, there you could have seen a, a, a nice poster of, of uh, Jingyi Lai and, and uh, Runyao Duan here. So they, they, they present evidence that in fact for each graph G there exists a particular SQL channel. In fact, one that you can obtain from Lovas' uh, characterization such that the upsilon is already equal to theta. So that, theta. that would mean that the regularization that we had to go through is actually not necessary if you just want to talk about lower sum. So this is, this is one of our biggest open problems. And with that, I, I finish because I think we all want to go in coffee break. Okay, it's now for questions. Uh, so you said that if there's some function of the graph that's between alpha and theta, that's multiplicative, it must be uh, yeah. theta itself. So I've probably learned and forgot this. Does that mean that C0 is, it, is not multiplicative? Yes, that was known uh, for a long time. I mean, it was an open problem, I think, for Shannon, mm -hmm. but it was, I think it was Hammer's paper that uh, presented, uh, happened to also present the first example for that. Yeah, yeah. and then Noga alone has another paper where he gives an, a full family of such things. And, and I guess another thing you could define is you could say, there's some function of a graph which is the most that alpha can go up by if you tensor with this graph. And I guess that's another way of saying is that number is just equal to theta. Um, you mean that you're looking at the ratio of alpha of g times h divided by alpha of g or something? Yeah, like the CB version ah, of it. This is actually, no, this is not theta. This is equal to the fraction packing number. Ah. This is known as Rosenfeld's theorem. Actually, I mean, I, I apologize. I refer to a paper there that we wrote last year, but we haven't posted it yet, which I, I really want to do that soon. So it's kind of pure graph theoretical and fun, <laughs> where we look at such things. I see. So when <laughs> you tensor on a graph, it can put, you can increase the capacity by this yes. fraction packing number, but kind of not repeatedly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, so if not, let's thank the speaker again. And <laughs> so we have a coffee break, and let's reconvene at 10 past 11.